and welcome to Church Online from the gorgeous Lockheed Park. And guess what? We've got Hollywood all the way in there. My name is Eloho and I just want to welcome you to uh, service today. Before we go into service, I'll just love to pray for us. Um, Father, we thank you for this morning. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Even as we gather together from all over the world, we know that your presence is here with us. And so we just want to commit the rest of the service into your hands from the worship to the word, that every word that will be spoken today will cause a transformation in the lives of the hearers, the listeners and the viewers in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, once again for your presence and thank you even for this beautiful location in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Awesome. If you're watching us on Facebook right now, would love to encourage you to head over to the platform and, and you, you find the link on the screen. Head over to the platform or on YouTube because um, Facebook restricts what we can share on Facebook. So please, please, please head over to the platform or Facebook. Besides, there's an amazing prayer team who's ready to pray with you today. So don't delay, head over to the platform now. Also, we'd love to invite you to join us for virtual coffee. You know, you can get to just meet people from all over the world. So remember to join for virtual coffee. And right about now, just want to invite the worship team as we go into a time of praise and worship.
Thank you, worship team, uh, for leading us in worship. Well, uh, Pastor Pete is going to continue in the Praise the Lord series. I mean, as a worship leader, as someone who loves worship, I love worship. I've really been encouraged and challenged by this series of Praise the Lord. Um, God is amazing. He's beautiful. He's worthy of all our praises. And sometimes in life we go through different challenges. <laughs> but um, this, this series is encouraging me personally that despite it all, you know, focus on giving him thanks and giving him praise because he is worthy and he's 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 worthy of all our praise really um so i would love to ask you online community to share your reflections on the praise the lord series have there been times in your life where you have been challenged and you're struggling to praise the lord i have like i said i've been challenged so many times but I, i've come to realize that you know when when I focus on praising him, there's a lifting that comes from praising him. So do share your reflections on praising the Lord with the community. I'm sure someone is going to be blessed by your reflections. All right. We're going to invite uh, Pastor Pete now to just share the word with us on praising the Lord. Hey, welcome to Church Online. My name is Pete, pastor here at City on a Hill. It's a joy to welcome you to our online experience uh, we're, in a moment, we're going to pray and then turn to the Bible. But I just want to say especially a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us for the first time. It's great to have you connecting. My hope is that this is a, a positive experience for you, that you draw close to God and that your life is impacted. Father, I thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, you know, each and every person connecting today. And thank you, God, you're a God who speaks. Thank you for the Bible. It's your word. And as we turn to the pages of the Bible, we discover you're the God who speaks through the Bible. Come Holy Spirit, enable me to hear, uh, to speak and enable everyone to hear. Come by your Holy Spirit. Uh, let us be impacted by your truth in Jesus' great name. Amen. Okay, so it, it, was, uh, it was Christmas time and there was um, a, a couple who had two kids and one kid was outrageously positive. I mean, all the time, only could see the good in every situation. And the other one was the opposite, outrageously negative. Only saw the bad in every tough situation. Even in the good situation, saw the bad. Anyway, so Christmas time comes and the parents thought, you know what, we're going to have to, we're going to try and balance things out here. So in the really negative kid's bedroom, they filled the bedroom to the ceiling with presents. Okay. And in the really positive kid's bedroom, they poured a pile of horse manure. <laughs> so anyway, they want to see, this, see what the reaction is when they wake up. In the morning, all they could hear was crying coming from the negative kid's room. So they went through and said, what's wrong? <laughs> Look at your presents, what's wrong? And the kid said, I don't know where to start. <laughs> and then they go into the positive kid's room and all they see is these two legs popping out and wiggling around out of the pile of horse manure. And they pulled the legs out and out popped the kid covered in horse manure and said, wow, I can't wait to find the pony that, lay, that, that poured this stuff. So, you know, you can be in the worst of situations but actually have a positive response. And that's what we're going to find in this psalm we're, we're in. We're in Psalm 147, and my title is Praise in, in the Middle of the Ruins, uh, because people are in the middle of the ruinous, ruined lives. People are in the middle of a tough situation, and yet they were finding reason to praise the Lord. It's interesting, that just as a bit of an overview, there are 150 psalms in the Bible, and the last five psalms all begin and end the same way. They start with Praise the Lord, or in Hebrew, hallelujah, and they end with praise the Lord. So they're called, the five, last five Psalms and the 150 Psalms are called the Hallelujah Psalms. So this is one of the Hallelujah Psalms. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Psalm 147. Let me read it to you, and then we're going to zoom in in some of the verses. Praise the Lord. It is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. 
the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of their stars, of the stars, and he gives to he gives all of them their names. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble and he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares the rains for the earth. He makes the grass grow in the, on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and the, to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word run, runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes the wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. <clears throat> They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Wow. Okay, so three encouragements. I'm not going to cover all those verses. I'm just going to jump into some of the ones at the beginning. Three encouragements for those who are in the midst of crisis. Number one, God restores you. Say that with me. God restores me. It says in verse two, the Lord builds up Jerusalem and he gathers <clears throat> the outcasts or the exiles, as another translation says, of Israel. So let's do a bit of work together here. It says he gathers, he builds up Jerusalem and he gathers the exiles or the outcasts of Israel. Question, when was the psalm written? Okay, so you just think about the verse we just read. He gathers the exiles of Israel. When's the psalm written? Well, Again, you don't need to be a Bible scholar. You can work that one out. It's written after the exile. So the history of Israel was that they were the people of God, rescued from slavery in Egypt, brought to a promised land. And in the promised land, God promised them, if you follow me and walk with me, it's going to go well with you. You're going to be blessed. But if you rebel against me and worship false gods, I will remove my hand of blessing and protection and you'll be overrun and eventually you'll be taken into exile. And after centuries of rebellion, that's exactly what happens. The people of Israel were taken into exile by the Babylonians. And that's where the book of Daniel was written. The book of uh, Ezekiel was written there as well. And, the, and they were in exile for a period of 70 years. And then after the exile, they returned to the ruins of Jerusalem. And this is where the psalm was written. So this is round about, the, the, uh, the exile ended 538 BC. So it's after that point. We don't know exactly when, but it's written to people. It says he gathers the outcasts or the exiles of Israel. Why were they in exile? Well, because of their idolatry, because of their sin. They were in exile as a consequence of their own actions. Yeah, I mean, this was the Babylonians, but it was their fault that they ended up in that situation. Let's continue verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So again, let's ask some questions. Why were they brokenhearted? Well, you imagine you've spent 70 years in exile. At 70 years in exile reflecting on your failure 70 years thinking we blew it we had everything god bless us with the land god bless us in so many ways and we turned our backs on god that's why we're in exile in this foreign land that's why the 70 years of pain of bereavement i mean many of them had lost parents in when the babylonians invaded israel in jerusalem many of them had lost siblings or or spouses or kids so they've got 70 years of bereavement as exiles in Babylon, pain, anguish, heartbreak. 70 years of actually reading the Old Testament, reading the prophets that predicted that if you keep sinning, you'll end up in exile. And they, they had 70 years to read those verses through and to reflect, you know what? We blew it. We totally ignored God. God warned us and here we are. 
70 years of cruel mistreatment at the hands of the Babylonians. They were, they were slaves. They'd been independent. They'd been their own people. They'd been autonomous. Now they were slaves and they had 70 years to reflect on. This is tough. And now they're, and, and now they're back in Jerusalem, but it ain't the Jerusalem that those who were old enough would remember. It was a Jerusalem in ruins, a Jerusalem that had been ransacked, a Jerusalem that had been devastated, walls had been broken down. It was a ruined city. In fact, it says in Nehemiah chapter three, verse one, um, one verse three, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace, or again, another translation says shame. So how were they feeling? Well, they were full of disgrace. They were full of shame. They were brokenhearted. And the Bible says that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. So he's, he's working among this people. This psalm is written to people who are back from exile. They're back in Jerusalem. They're brokenhearted. They realize it's been our own sin. Do you know, and you might be brokenhearted today. Maybe you're brokenhearted because of what people have done to you. You're brokenhearted by the way others treated you. Some of you are brokenhearted by what you've done yourself. You're carrying so many regrets, past stupidity. I mean, we're humans, we've made stupid mistakes. You're carrying the regret of that. Maybe you're, you're grieving, you, maybe you're brokenhearted because of the loss of a relationship. Maybe you're brokenhearted because of an unreversible decision that you made and you can't go back and change it and you wish with everything within you you could, but you can't and you're brokenhearted. Well, the good news of this Sam is that he binds up the brokenhearted and I believe he's gonna do that for your life. He goes on in verse four, he says he determines the number of the stars and he gives them all their names. And why is he suddenly talking, you know, he's talking about he's going to bring back the exiles, he's healing the brokenhearted. Why is he now talking about he, he, he determines the number of the stars and he knows their names? Well, I think, I think he's talking about that because the stars speak of the people of Israel. It says in Genesis 26, 4, God spoke to Abraham centuries before about this people who would be born, his people, the people of Israel. He said, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and we will give them these lands. So I think when God's now saying, the Bible says he determines the number of the stars, I think he's saying, every single one of you people of God, every one of you, you're numbered. I know your name. I know who you are. So you might feel like an exile. You might feel like abandoned by God, but God has not abandoned you. He knows your name. He has a plan for your life. A few weeks ago, I was, I was down in London and um, for, for a short conference. And when I was coming back, I was at Heathrow Airport getting the flight back to Edinburgh. And in Heathrow Airport, I just were in a queue waiting for the plane. And I got chatting to the guy who was, who was standing beside. A really nice guy called Nigel. And he's a, uh, he was a, a lecturer in, in theater in Los Angeles, originally from Scotland. And we just got into this conversation and I was sad to hear that he was coming back to Scotland because of a bereavement. But in the course of the conversation, the conversation got round to spiritual things. He asked me what I did. I, I said, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. And he said, that's amazing. He said, I've got friends who are pastors of churches. And then he went on to tell me his story. He said that when he, you know, he's, I guess, maybe coming towards retirement himself. He's a, he's a, he's a grandparent. So, but but when, he, when he was in his early 20s, he said he was a student and several of him, him, he and his friends, several of them became Christians. They decided to follow Jesus. And he was one of them. He had made a decision in his early twenties to follow Jesus. And, and, and many of his friends had too. And he said, many of my friends went on to live a life for God. Some of them went on to become pastors. Different people went on to do different things. But he said, I made a decision to follow Jesus, but I've never done anything with it. And this is like, this is decades later, decades later. And he could see he had a sense of regret that he hadn't followed through in that decision he'd made when he was in his early 20s. And he was, we had a really good conversation. I was able to tell him about God's love. And uh, like those stars that are numbered, God's got you numbered. He hasn't forgotten you. And he, he sent me this text message afterwards. We exchanged details and he, he sent me this text message. He said, it was just a blessing to meet you, Peter. I can't tell you how dark things have been in my life recently at work and with my wife's dad's death. God put you in the queue to talk to me and to make me start thinking about who I am and how I want God to shine in my life again. I'll keep in touch. I love that. God has a plan for you. He hasn't abandoned you. You may have moved away yourself, but he hasn't gone anywhere. He's consistently for you and he loves you. And the verses go on and it says in verse, it, it, it says in verses uh, four, five and six, 
great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. This is talking about he's abundant in power. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. And he's, he says his understanding is beyond measure. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And then it goes on, this God who's all powerful and all knowing in verses five and six. And it says, the Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. See, this, this God, this great God, this God who is so magnificent, he's omnipotent, all powerful. He's omniscient. He knows everything. This great God whom the heavens cannot even contain. The Bible says he's drawn to a particular type of person. And it says he lifts up the humble, lifts up the humble. He's drawn, God is drawn to human beings that are humble and repentant. God can cope with our inadequacy, but he cannot cope with our self-sufficiency. He is drawn to people who are humble and say, God, I need you. He's drawn. This great God is drawn to come real close to people like that. I love the account that Jesus told of the prodigal son. And it's a, I guess it's a bit like these people in the Sam, these people in Sam who were who were who had just come back from exile. They were living with regret for what they had done, the, the years they'd wasted, the, the lives they had lived. They were knowing they couldn't turn back time. And now they were back in a city that was ruined and their hearts were broken because of their memories of, of what could have been. And here they are, God's got their number, God knows their name and God's not quit on them and they're humbled and they're repentant. Reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. Jesus said this, this is, I love this, it's in Luke chapter 15. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property among them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country and when, and who sent him to the, his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. I love that. His, this is a picture of God that God, as soon as anyone humbles himself and says, God, I've blown it, I'm coming back to you. Well, I love that, that the father saw him coming. All, he, all God's waiting for is that you take that one step and then God will do the rest. And, and, and he says he put a ring on his finger. That's reminding him, you're in covenant, an unbreakable relationship. He put sandals on his feet because slaves wore bare feet, whereas sons wore sandals. And he put a robe on him and that re reflected how God covers us, our shame, and covers our unrighteousness with his righteousness and his forgiveness. It's interesting, in the Buddhist scriptures, um, the Lotus Sutra, there is a story which is so closely resembling the prodigal son, except for the ending. And it's almost an identical story. A son decides to rebel against his father, goes away, lives a crazy life, lives a wild life, comes to a place of regret, because when people are living crazy, when they're away from God, you always come to rock bottom. Comes to a place of deep regret, and he thinks, man, I've got to go back to the father. And he goes back to the father. And, but instead of the father welcoming him and back, he goes back and he serves in his father's house as a servant. Uh, and his years of servitude pay back the debt that he owed for the life he had lived. That's a very different outcome. That's the difference between Christianity and other religions. That Christianity is God doing something for us. Religion is about us doing something for God. What we see in, in, in this Christian faith, you see it's different to karma. Karma um, is, is what you see in, in religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Karma says, if you sin, you pay. 
But grace says, if you sin, he pays. You see, 2,000 years ago on a cross, God came into this world. He paid the price for sinners like us. He was broken so that the brokenhearted could be made whole. He was an outcast so that those who are outcast could be welcomed back. He was shamed. He was treated like a criminal, although he had done no sin. And Jesus died in our place. And it's interesting, Buddha's last words on earth was, strive earnestly. Jesus' last words he spoke before breathing his last was, it is finished. Religion says do. Christianity says done. The price is paid. Your sins are forgiven. He's cleansed your sin. You trust him. You're eternally saved. And so like the prodigal son, we get to come home and the father welcomes us home. And he doesn't say, okay, right, you blew it. So even though you're back home, you're going to start back down here again. No, God says, I restore you to the same position you were at. Whether you've been away for years and you're coming back, you're exactly where we left off. Let's pick up again. You're my son, you're my daughter. Let's go again. He heals the brokenhearted. He welcomes the outcast back. I love that. It says in verse 11, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Those who fear him. E. Stanley Jones, famous missionary, he was in a church in Copenhagen and, he re- and this is what he said about, he recalls the experience. He says, I walked up the cathedral aisle to see the wonderful statue. It's a famous statue of Jesus in this church in Copenhagen. He said, as I walked up the cathedral aisle to see this wonderful statue, I was almost overcome with awe. But as I walked along, my Danish friend whispered, you will not be able to see his face unless you kneel at his feet. And it was true, for Christ was standing with outstretched arms, but looking downwards. I knelt at his feet and only then was his face looking into mine. You can only really see Christ. You can't really see Christ until you surrender to him. Those who start far off surveying him will never see his face. So bend the knee, be conquered by him, surrender yourself. The verse says the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. It's like that humility, he's drawn to humility. We've got that fear of God. We come on our knees before him. But we don't just come on our knees before him because it says he takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. So you're not just coming on your knees before him with your head bowed. You're coming with your knees before him with your head raised up, looking into the face that's looking down. And you know what? He takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope. His face is smiling. You're on your knees. You're humbled. You're brokenhearted. You're fearing the Lord, not in a dreading sense, but in a deep reverent sense. You're on your knees but your head's not down, your head's up. You're hoping in his steadfast love. And as you're looking into his face, his face is smiling. His demeanor towards you is positive. I love that. I so love that. And City on a Hill, that's our mission. Our mission is to welcome the outcasts. Our wish, our mission is to bring in the exiles, people who have been brokenhearted, people who've been away from God, people who've been far from God and never thought God would want anything to do with them. They have good news coming. They can know Jesus. That's why we exist as a church, to introduce people to Jesus and help them grow in that faith. We're outcasts welcoming outcasts in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Okay, point number one, he he restores you. Point number two, he restores us collectively, the church, his people. This is what it says in verse two again. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts or the exiles of Israel. He builds up Jerusalem, it says. Now, Jerusalem in the Old Testament was the picture of God's people. It was, the, it was the dwelling place of God's people. Today, that reflects to the church. We are, I guess you could say, the new Jerusalem. We are the people of God. So when it says he builds up Jerusalem, hey, in the time when they came back from Babylon in exile, it was in ruins, Jerusalem. It says in Nehemiah 1 verse 3, this is the second part of the verse, Those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. So here's this situation where they're back in this city, and hey, they're glad to be back, but it ain't like the city it used to be. It's ruins. They're among the ruins. And I don't know when this psalm was written. I don't know how far through the rebuilding process. You remember Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of the city? 
and, uh, and Zerubbabel and others rebuilt the temple. I don't know what, at what point this psalm was written, at what point during the construction, but it wasn't the same city. It was a ruined city. They were among the ruins. And I think it's a picture of the church. Here's, here's how the church is going globally. Okay, here's some facts and trends. Number one, Christianity is growing faster than the world population. Number two, Pentecostal and evangelical believers in particular are growing the fastest and still picking up speed. Number three, atheism has peaked. There are 27 million less atheists than there were in 1970. Number four, the percentage of unevangelized is shrinking. It's shrinking from 54.3% in the 1900s down to only 28.4% in 2019. So these are great things. I mean, the church is growing. Christianity is expanding. It's going great. But right here in Scotland, it's like we're in among the ruins. So here's some figures about Scotland. And this is from people like Peter Briley or the Barna Research Group. Listen to this. On average, 10 Scottish churches close every month. Nearly half of the church in Scotland is over 65. And since 2002, one third of the church in Scotland has disappeared. So we're in a situation where it's like, hey, where are the church? But the church in Scotland is in ruins. All over the world, the church is growing in various degrees. But in Scotland, it's almost receding. But the Bible says the Lord builds up Jerusalem. The Lord does that. That's God's work. God's responsibility is to build up Jerusalem. And what happened in their time, way back on the back of the exile, is God raised up a person called Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was used by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that had been sitting devastated for decades. And it, it devastated for decades. And yet, in 52 days, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. Miraculous speed. And he repaired three miles of wall. Some of the walls were two meters deep and nine meters high at points. They repaired that much wall in 52 days against opposition outside and inside. A miracle. God truly did, just like the psalm says, God rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and he used a man called Nehemiah. And do you know what Jesus said about the church? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. He said, I will build my church. And I am convinced that in our generation, Jesus is building his church right here in Scotland, where it seems like churches are, have no hope, that the churches are declining. No, best days are ahead for the church. By God's grace, we've seen growth and other churches are seeing growth and the best is yet ahead. Do you know, I have huge hope for Scotland. Let me give you one of the reasons why I have hope for Scotland. Matthew Henry, the famous commentator said this, when God intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does is set them a praying. And all I know is this, we aren't seeing revival yet, but what I am seeing is God's people are a praying like never before. Pastors, I, I, I have the privilege of leading a pastor's prayer event weekly in Edinburgh. Every year we gather pastors together by the hundreds to pray for our nation. All over the nation, different towns and cities, prayer groups are starting as pastors and people are getting together to call on the Lord for our nation. And when God stirs prayer in the nation, he is doing that to prepare the way for revival. So the Lord is going to build up Jerusalem. God is going to build up his church in our nation. Say amen if you agree. And if you're part of another nation, may God do it there too. And then point, uh, uh, then it, let's continue in the verse. It says in verse 13 and 14, he strengthens the bars of your gates, talking about Jerusalem. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. In other words, God doesn't just build up the walls of Jerusalem and get you back on your feet and then abandon you. He, he, he blesses you. He, he doesn't just get you back on your feet. He pours out blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And that's what God does in our lives. And that's what God does in this church. God's basically saying, hey, the best is yet to come. It says, in fact, at the time of the rebuilding of, of Jerusalem and the temple, one of the prophets who were speaking at the time, at this period, was Haggai. In Haggai 2.9, he said, the, glory, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, this temple, this house of God, this place of worship, yeah, you thought it was good in the past, but the best days are ahead, says the Lord. That was the prophecy. You know, when we, just at the beginning of the pandemic, um, our church and our leaders, we had a prophecy. Our dear friend, Ali Brown, she's a prophet. She's from the Northeast of England. And as, as, as leaders, they're part of the Go Global family of churches. They lead a great church down there in Newcastle and New Brigham. Ali Brown brought a prophecy to us. 
And this was a prophecy, let me, let me read it. She said, I saw the Edinburgh church like a large whale, like a big sea creature. It was moving fast under the surface. And then she said, in the picture, I could see that it was getting ready to surface and, and there was gonna be a, like a wow moment. And people, were, she said, in the picture she saw, people were gonna stand back and say, wow, look at that. And she said, what was gonna come out of the water was gonna to totally stand out. And I remember that prophecy coming in April, 2020. Lockdown had just started. And I remember me and my elders and pastors, we were having several meetings during lockdown, thinking about what, what kind of church do we wanna be when we come out. And this prophecy was in our mind thinking, well, what's gonna happen that's gonna be so dramatic? I mean, what's gonna happen that's gonna be so dramatic that people are literally gonna be like, whoa, we didn't see that coming. And we had no idea, we didn't know. But then when we came out of lockdown and then all that happened happened and we had to leave the movement we'd been part of, overnight our church took on this new name and new identity. It was like, wow, where did that come from? And overnight a family of churches go global came into being and a unity movement in our nation was birthed. Incredible. And it was like this sea creature coming out of the water and people thought, no way, we hadn't seen that before. God knew, God had us covered. God doesn't just get us back on our feet. He, he knows what's coming, he prepared us. And after all that happened, happened, and you've heard me say this prophecy before, and the reason I repeat it is because it means so much to me. And for our church, it's so important. A pastor came across the town to see me. He turned up at my house and he gave me, he'd written it down, a prophecy. And the prophecy says, I have a picture of you being like a tree that's been cut down to the stump. And as a, as a church, that's how we felt. We, we'd, had, we'd had buildings taken from us that we had bought. We had, uh, our name were slandered. We, we'd gone through so much upheaval. All of a sudden, we were a very large, homeless and destitute church, hundreds of people, but no buildings, no charity, nothing. And I saw in the picture you being like a tree that's cut down to the stump, but God says that what will grow from the stump will be bigger and healthier than what was there before. And a few, that was so encouraging that what was gonna grow from the stump was gonna be bigger and healthier. But then a few days of that prophecy coming, a friend, Alistair Matheson, came across from Glasgow to see me. We had a coffee and after the coffee, we were praying. And during the prayer time, he says, I have this vision of you being like a tree that's cut down to the stump. But I see in the vision, what's gonna grow from the stump will be bigger and healthier than what was there before. It was the exact same prophecy. And then the third time, another leader in our church came with the exact same set of prophet, prophetic words. And all I know is this city on a hill church, God planned our future. We are, yeah, we're still a little bit in among the ruins. It still ain't perfect. We're still feeling a little bit rough at the edges. But the future is great. As we're standing among the ruins, the best is yet to come. I believe favour of God is on us as a church. Church online, I believe favour of God is on us. Church in person, I believe favour of God is upon us. I believe we can totally expect blessings on individual lives and upon us as a collective people. I believe for pay rises. I really believe for provisions and dramatic healings. I believe, if, I mean, we've seen great things in the past, but nothing compared to what we're gonna see in the days ahead. God's gonna open doors. God's gonna create influence. We lost buildings that are ours. And yet God's gonna bless us with even more buildings and better buildings. And I don't say that arrogantly. I'm so grateful to him. I believe he's gonna do it. I, I, I think we had influence, but I think God's gonna give us even more influence ahead. He's gonna open the door. We're gonna see more small groups, more salvations, more baptisms, more church plants. We've seen church plants all over the world but we're gonna see even more church plants in the days ahead. I really believe God's favor is upon us. And he builds up Jerusalem and he fills Jerusalem and he blesses Jerusalem. And I believe he isn't just getting us back on our feet. I believe he's saying the best is yet to come. And then coming into land, point number three is praise him in the ruins. The verse one and the very last verse of the Psalm is praise the Lord. Say that with me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And it starts and ends that way with praise the Lord. And I don't know, again, I don't know what, at what stage in the rebuilding process they were at right here when the psalm was written. It might have been they were literally standing among the ruins or maybe there'd been a bit of refurbishment already taking place. But all I would know is this, that no matter what stage they were at in their rebuilding, they were to praise the Lord. And no matter how unfinished you feel or how, no matter how unfinished we feel, in the midst of it, we say, praise the Lord. On May the 6th, 1954, Roger Bannister became the first athlete, the first man in history to 
run a mile in less than four minutes. An incredible achievement. Within two months of that, John Landy beat Roger Bannister's record by 1.4 seconds. Unbelievable. Anyway, on August the 7th, 1954, the two of them met for a race. Quite an incredible moment, an incredible race. And as they were running this race, and as they were coming into the last lap of the race, uh, Landy, as he was leading the way ahead of Roger Bannister, suddenly had the thought, where's Bannister? And he was troubled thinking, where is he? And as he turned to look, and in that moment, as he turned to look, Bannister overtook him. And later, when the Time magazine interviewed him, he said this in the interview, if I, if I hadn't looked back, I would have won. If I hadn't looked back, I would have won. And I think so often in life, it's those moments when we spend our time looking back that we end up missing out on the good things God's got. So do you know what? You can't change the past. You can't live with your, in your regrets. You've got to know the grace of a great God and know that in the middle of the ruins that you find yourself in, he can rebuild you right there. So praise God when you're broken down, humbled on your knees, like returned exiles, outcasts that have come back. Praise God. Praise God while you're standing among the ruins of a life that was, and yet you're looking to a God who's got a future ahead of you. Praise God because you've got, your eyes are looking up at him and you see his steadfast love in his face and you know he's for you. Praise God. Praise while standing in the ruins of a broken life. Praise while standing there even with a broken heart. Praise as we are rebuilding a broken church. Praise God in the ruins. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful to you for this psalm. Thank you, God, in the middle of a, a, a time of heartbreak, a time of regret, a time of rebuilding. You spoke your word. You gave this psalm to this people who were living with all these emotions. Oh, Lord God, my prayer for everyone who's joining today, as no matter where we're at, maybe some people are carrying the greatest of regrets, living with the greatest of uh, pain in their hearts because of what was done to them or because of their own mistakes. My prayer today, God, is that we would be able to, like that story, we'd be able to be in our knees before Jesus, not with our heads down, but be in our knees before Jesus in humility, but with our heads up, looking into his face and seeing you smiling upon us. Thank you for your goodness and your grace and your favour. Just wherever you are, start praying your own prayers to God. If you've got regrets, give them to him. Humble yourself before him. Don't just recognise you've sinned. Repent for the sin. Ask him for his forgiveness. Experience his grace. Receive his grace. Receive his mercy. And enjoy his favour. While people are praying, maybe you're joining and you haven't, maybe you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus. He gave everything for you. And he, today he invites you to give yourself to him. And as you do that, you receive his forgiveness. You don't have to earn it. You just receive it. You trust in Jesus. Give your life to him. Turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. If that's you today, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, thank you for your love. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. No one else has done this for me. I'm so grateful to you for paying the price for my sins on the cross. On the third day, I know that you rose again. And I believe you're alive right now. Jesus, be Lord of my life from this day forward. I commit myself to you. Thanks for hearing my prayer and accepting me. I see your grace in your face. Thank you for your for me and with me. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to know that you've done that. Please, could you just reach out to us and let us know and we will do everything we can to help you in your faith journey. God bless you. Let's praise God, even in the middle of the ruins.
Welcome back to Online Church and thank you worship team. Thank you for Pastor Pete for encouraging us to praise God at all times through the rains, in the storms, knowing that God is not far away from us and we can reach out to him in praise and in worship. Amazing. Now we're going to give. But before we give, before we invite you to give, just want to say a big thank you to every person who has been giving generously and regularly. We pray that God will reward you a hundredfold returns in the mighty name of Jesus. As we move into communities, the needs are growing, are getting bigger, and we need you, we need your support. So we want to invite you to give generously as well as serve. You know, if you're wondering how can I serve, how can I give, all of the details are on the website. And um, as we move into community gatherings, the times have changed. So you would need to go into our website to check uh, for the different communities, the different locations where they are and the times that um, we are meeting. In. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us today. It's time for virtual coffee after the service. Don't miss it. And you can join us again online next week at 10.30 a.m. God bless you and I'll see you soon. Bye.